my mother-in-law tried to attack me with a blunt object. Yeah, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I just want to let you guys know my absolute hatred for this woman. Well, let me take you back to the night when she attacked me with a baseball bat. I wanted my mother-in-law out of our house, but my husband doesn't want to. I thought I'd share a bit more about John's backstory and give you a glimpse into what has shaped his relationship with my mother-in-law. For privacy purposes, let's call my husband John and mother-in-law Susan. I never met my father-in-law. Unfortunately, life had other plans. John's father passed away when he was just 20. While he was in his second year at university and things went a bit haywire. My husband's an only child and his dad was the sole provider in their household. So imagine how that affected them. Imagine the weight of not just losing a loved one, but having to tackle the financial fallout that follows. They were left grappling with loss and the harsh reality of being suddenly single-handedly responsible for their home. Being the only child, he had no sibling backup. It was all on him and his mom. Anyways, John studied at a private university and although his dad left him college funds, it was not enough. The funds that were supposed to carry John through the university were drained by the well, third year at the college. It was a tough time and, well, to make ends meet, they had to sacrifice a lot. With the college funds dried up and bills piling higher than a mountain, they had to sell their family house during his last year in school. And instead of transferring to a more affordable school, Susan figured that it was best to just finish studying there. Selling their home was a tough call and, you know, it was the place where John's childhood echoed and lingered. Where the family dinners and laughter echoed through the hallways. It's not just a house, it's a symbol of everything they went through after his dad passed away. Selling it was a massive sacrifice for them. Tough doesn't even begin to cover it, but they had no choice. They had to rent a small apartment near John's school. John told me that it was a two-bedroom apartment, so he and Susan each have their own bedrooms. He told me that he was initially against the idea, because let's face it, a two-bedroom place can be so much pricier. Money was tight, and he knew that, but Susan insisted, and mothers, uh, as you might know, have a way of making their point. Fortunately, their family received funds from my father-in-law's work and government support, and John was eligible for the student assistant program at his university, and this made their lives easier because they could pay bills still. However, that also did not last long. With their lifestyle at that time, the funds and the financial assistance can no longer sustain it. It kept them afloat, but they knew that it could not last. Susan had to pull double shift to pay their bills, and she practically was working day and night to keep the bills paid. John, being the responsible guy that he is, chips in what part-time gig, well, they had while studying, it's the kind of bonding over struggles that you never signed up for, but it brought them closer. So when John graduated, he immediately looked for work, and that's where I met him. John is much older than me. He's my senior and the one who helped and guided me when I started working in the company. Because of that, it made us close. We're crunching numbers, dealing with spreadsheets, and basically living the thrilling life of office workers. Romantic, right? But you know what they say, love can bloom in the most unexpected places, even in the midst of Excel sheets and financial reports. John took me under his wing from day one. He was like my master Yoda, guiding me through the mysterious ways of balancing books and keeping the ledgers in check. It wasn't just about work. He shared antidotes, cracked the occasional office joke even, and basically made work feel uh, less like a chore. After a year of working side by side, late night work turned into coffee breaks, and coffee breaks turned into shared lunches. We discovered we shared uh, more than just a passion for debits and credits. We had a similar taste in music, movies even, and an uncanny love for extra cheese on our pizza. <laughs> then on one of our after work dinners, he told me he wanted to treat me better because it was our payday. He brought me into our usual pizza place and ordered a whole 16-inch pizza with extra cheese and pepperonis. Don't worry, guys, there's no food waste here, because we finished it in one sitting. Anyways, halfway through the pizza, he asked me questions that changed our life. 
No dramatic background music, just the hum of people chatting. And the distant clattering of kitchen tools and equipment. I mean, John, a bit nervous but mostly excited, finally confessed that he wasn't just into spreadsheets and formulas. He was into me. Cue the eyebrow raise and the classic, Wait, really? from yours truly. But hey, John was genuine and sincerity goes a long way. Fast forward another year. Filled with shared laughter, inside jokes, and a few harmless office pranks, we made it official. I was 25. John was 29. And our journey from mentor trainee to colleagues in love was officially sealed with a cheesy pizza celebration. Our specialty... Our love story wasn't written in the stars, it was inked in the margin of balance sheets and etched into the coffee-stained pages of our shared workload. We became the power couple of our department, balancing both the books and our love life. On our first anniversary, John made a big decision, and no, it wasn't a proposal. Not yet. He told me that he wanted to buy a house so he and Susan can move out of the apartment. Living in that apartment had been a part of their story for far too long. It was time for a change, and John wanted to make that change happen. He wanted a place where his mother could finally have the peace and comfort she deserved. And it's not just an ordinary house. Apparently, he was contemplating four months if he should buy a house that year, and then on the day of our anniversary, he saw a posting that their old house was being sold. John's emotionally attachment to the house... Well, understandably so, but anyways, I guess he thought it was a sign to buy a house. Their old house sent on our anniversary. The excitement in John's voice as he detailed his dream house, the plans, I, I can say it was pretty contagious. He talked about the backyard where we could host family barbecues, the spacious kitchens where we could cook up storms, or in my case, attempt to not burn everything, and the rooms where memories would be made. But what made me happy the most was when he told me that it would also be the house where we would build our family. I'm not kidding. When those words hit my ears, it was like someone cranked up the volume of my heartbeat. I felt my heart wanting to get out of my chest. Oh, I love being in love. It's just that I never thought he would already see me as his future, and I feel the same way. But what made me happiest was when he asked if I wanted to move in with his mother. As much as I wanted to, it was a big leap for me, considering we were just a year from our relationship, so I declined his offer. But I assured him that I would want to, just not now. Don't get me wrong, the idea of sharing a roof with him and his mother sounded good, but I needed to be sure. I wanted our relationship to simmer a bit more, you know? And I love how he understands me. He did not push, did not resist, and instead he just nodded, giving me reassuring and smiles and said, Whenever I'm ready. I'm so sorry for the long backstory. I got carried away. <laughs> it would be a waste if I just deleted it, though. Anyways, here comes the fun part. After they moved into their house, John resigned from the company that we were working at and moved somewhere closer to the home. Anyways, I was almost always staying at their house. Besides the fact that I was more than welcome to stay there, I enjoyed staying by his side. But staying in his house came with a cost. Throughout our relationship, I wasn't able to meet Susan that often so I got to know her more when I was staying with him. Susan always jokingly says that I'm always in their house and that I'm snatching the sun away from her. The first few times she said it, I chuckled, thinking it was just a friendly jab. Little did I know there might be some truth lingering beneath the surface. Whenever I have the pleasure of Susan's company, I notice that she slightly doesn't like me. Slightly because I'm actually confused whether she likes me or not. One day, she treats me like a daughter, then an outsider when she's not in the mood. I'm not a mind reader, but something's definitely off. One time, when I stayed overnight, I think Susan purposely cooked dinner for two people. Her and John. She said sorry and told me she didn't know that I was there, and John promised her that night was their bonding alone time. Emphasis on the word alone. But I swear I greeted her that day when I arrived, so how could she forget? I told this to John, and he just told me that she must have forgotten given to the fact that I just stayed in the room the whole time I stayed there, and that Susan's pretty old. Classic case of blame the age card. But who am I to argue with him, considering that we're talking about his mom? Now, let me tell you, this was just the tip of the iceberg. 
You guys don't know how many more similar situations happen like that. After a year of basically turning their place into my second home, I decided to move in with them. I mean, what's the difference? I was practically there every day anyways. So why not take the plunge and move in? Unlike John, I did not resign and find another workplace. I wanted to stay a little bit longer at my first company before moving on. And then after a year, on our third anniversary celebration, John told me to marry him. It was a cozy evening and Susan was on, you know, her way out of town with the relatives. The smell of homemade lasagna wafted through the air and John nervously fidgeted with something in his pocket. Before I could even process what was happening, he asked me a question every woman wants to hear. He looked me dead in the eyes and said that since we've been doing this living together thing pretty well, how about we just make it official and tie the knot? Well, the lasagna in the oven could have burned to a crisp. I wouldn't have cared. It was sweet, simple, and totally John. It was one of those surreal moments where you can feel the time stop, and I realized that our everyday kind of love was the kind I wanted for a lifetime. No grand gestures, just two people deciding to do life together. And it also made me remember that the time when he confessed his feelings for me at a simple dinner at our favorite pizza store. Anyways, of course, I said yes. And just like that, I'm now married to the absolute love of my life. Now, the transition from I practically live here to I do live here <laughs> was surprisingly smooth. Instead, it was a gradual merging of lives filled with shared meals, movie nights, and the occasional friendly argument about whose turn it is to do the dishes. But living with Susan became a daily guessing game, a game I never signed up for but played nonetheless. On one hand, there were moments that made me question if maybe, just maybe, Susan secretly harbored a liking for me. Especially when John was with us and she surprised me with my favorite snacks and shared little stories about John's childhood. Intimate details that felt like we were really bonding. But then, without a warning, Susan would do something weird. I'd walk into the kitchen to find her meticulously avoiding eye contact, her silence echoing louder than any words could. One of the pinnacle moments of Susan's love-hate relationship with me was during the family movie night. John, Susan, and I cozy on the couch with a bowl of popcorn. Sounds picture perfect, right? Wrong! Susan positioned herself between us, and I mean that was weird, right? Plus tell me if you guys thought that was weird too. As we laughed at the movie, I could not help but feel um, a bit of awkwardness. However, like what I've been saying, my relationship with Susan wasn't all hate. There were moments when Susan seemed genuinely content with my presence. She'd invite me to join her for some green tea and ask about my day, and in those fleeting instances, it felt like I was fully accepted into the household. Of course, I talked to John about this, and as usual, he just brushed it off and told me that Susan was not in the best of mood, and I should try to understand her. I mean, I get why he's thinking like that, but they've suffered so much together, so he just doesn't want to bother his mother and make her feel uncomfortable, and if I was in his position, I would think Susan was just not in the mood, because honestly, she never fails to show me that she's a good mother, but I don't know. Those little situations just don't feel right. I mean, she could totally stop doing that, and I know you guys will tell me to call her out. Well, I don't have the guts to call her out, so I was hoping John could do it, but oh well. Anyways, two days ago, my patience could no longer take it. It was our fourth anniversary as a couple and one year anniversary as a husband and wife, so it was very important for me. We planned a weekend getaway and I booked us an Airbnb. It was a one and a half ride from our house. Yeah, you know, away from people we know. I wanted that weekend to be special and just for us, but before we could even put our things in the closet, Susan called and told us that there was an emergency and we need to get home. She said that, well, she could not stand and that she can't fill her legs. We told her to call emergency now and she told us that she'll call right after that call. Her tone was serious and her voice was shaking, so we rushed home. On the way back, we were trying to contact her, but we could not reach her, so we were afraid she wasn't able to call the ambulance. We were so anxious, especially John. When we did, we did not expect what we saw when we got there. Well, when we entered the house, expecting to find a worried Susan, but there she was, perfectly standing in the kitchen with a grin on her face. There was tons of food on the table, and the smell of whatever she was cooking filled our noses. 
John fell to his knees and I could see the tears running down his cheeks. Susan asked what was wrong and just told us that she wanted to surprise us with a fancy dinner just because. Oh, not because it was our anniversary, but just because she felt like it. Mm, sure. John hugged her, sighed a little sigh of relief, and it all seemed right in his world. After calming everyone down, we ate our food and I was just quiet the whole time. I could not believe this. Susan ruined our weekend celebration just because she wanted to treat us to dinner? How could she? And you know what? When I asked her if she cooked all the food because of our anniversary, you know what she said? Oh, it's your anniversary? Happy anniversary! Oh my gosh! I could still hear what she said in my ears. After eating, we went to our bedroom and told John my frustrations. I could not let this pass, but to my dismay, he got angry at me and told me that I should not, you know, do this and just stop involving him in our fiasco. Well, I was disappointed. I hurriedly went downstairs and confronted Susan. I vented, well, my frustrations out, and only to be met with her cold glare. When I finished, she had the nerve to whisper that I was getting on her nerves and better not push her to the point of kicking me out. Can you believe the audacity of this woman? Without looking back, I left and sought a refugee in the Airbnb I booked. Celebrating our anniversary alone wasn't what I envisioned. I'm still here and my emotions are all over the place. So I'm sorry if this post is a little bit confusing. Anyways, my husband has not contacted me yet, and I don't want to be the first one to make a move. I don't know, should I contact him and apologize for what I did? But I feel like I did not do anything wrong. I think I'm the victim here. Anyways, do you guys have any suggestions or advice? Update number one. Hey guys, I just wanted to update you on what's been going on. It's been a week and a half since my last post, so I apologize for taking too long to update. There was a comment there that got my attention. And after days of reflection, I just realized, you know what, you're right. My mother-in-law was just nice to me whenever John was there or if she needed something from me. My mind was clouded as I wanted validation from the mother of my husband that I was blinded by her manipulation. Anyways, for those of you who were telling me to divorce my husband, no, I would not do that because we love each other. I know that he was just trying to make his mother stress-free after all that they've been through and I understand him. That's why I agreed with those who commented that I should set boundaries and that's exactly what I've done. First, I just want to let you know what happened after I left the house. A day after my post, I moved to a hotel near my workplace, so it'll be a lot easier to travel. And after a week of staying there, I got a knock on my door. To my surprise, it was my husband. He immediately hugged me as I opened the door and told me that he's sorry for getting angry at me and leaving me alone for a week. I asked why it took him a week to come to me, and you guys know what he said? It's because Susan told him that he should give me time and space. But hey, better late than never. John could not bear the separation any longer, so he shrugged off Susan's advice and bolted to find me after work. Guess mommy doesn't really want us to live happily ever after. So John and I had a heart talk to talk, and he was genuinely sorry for not seeing through her act a little bit earlier than what he did. After some intense talk, John and I decided to establish boundaries and that Susan needed to leave the house. I told him what you guys even commented, that we were now building a family and I don't feel safe around her and I'm simply not comfortable. So John finally agreed after some pleading and straight up insisting. The decision was made. Susan, she has to go. We stayed the night there and went home the next day to tell Susan what John and I spoke about. Confronting Susan was never going to be a walk in the park, but it was a battle we were ready to face. Susan's reaction? Well, she was shocked, she was angry, and as we talked, Susan tried every trick in the book. Guilt tripping, gaslighting, even playing the victim. Ah, oh, man. I could see John wrestling with conflicting emotions and the son torn between his loyalty to mom and the wife that he vowed to protect forever. Then came the desperate plea to let her stay for a while. Yes, it was a tough moment. I could rob John of that short moment with his mother, but I would not. 
so he agreed to give her a reasonable time frame to find a place to stay just to sort out her affairs. Anyways, that's it for the update, really. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for your suggestions, for your advice. As you all can see it helped me take care of the situation and get back to my husband. I do appreciate it. Ciao. Update number two. I never would have thought my mother-in-law Susan would do something like hitting me with a bat. Yeah. So two weeks after the confrontation, everything was weird and awkward in the house. Susan made my life a living hell. Whenever I'm outside the bedroom, I can always see Susan's demonic eyes looking at me. And when she cooks, the food gives me an awful, salty, spicy, bland taste now. There's times when I open up my drawer and there's this big dead insect in the middle. Or when every pair of my footwear is hidden and scattered in the house. But what I hate the most is that snarky question to my husband if he was sure about me over dinner. Ugh. I swear this woman is so out of line. But after all that she's been doing to me, I decide to just not give her the attention because I figured she would be out of the house soon. And now that she has shown her true colors, I'm proud to say that I hate her from the bottom of my heart. I never imagined that she was going to be like this. But what shocked me the most was what happened last night. Christmas Eve. We have this small gathering at our house with a few of my relatives. It was past midnight and everybody was drinking, except for me. Especially Susan. I mean, she was drunk. You should see her trying to wobble. The gathering was happening in our backyard, food everywhere, scattered chairs, even teenagers awake at that hour. And the uncles were drinking beer. But some were inside the house, in the living room, you know, to have some quiet time where the lights were off. I wanted to rest because I'd waken for almost 24 hours at that time, so I decided to go inside. As I was about to round the door, I noticed that Susan was just walking behind me in an uncoordinated manner. In one hand, she clutched a wine bottle. In the other, a bat swung aimlessly through the air. Confusion clouded my tired mind and nervous laughter escaped my lips. What on earth was she up to? I wanted to lie down, so I went straight to the living room. But before my butt even touched the sofa, I felt a sudden jolt of pain searing through my shoulders. After my eyes adjusted to the dim room, that's where I saw it. Susan, holding a bat, and was about to go to town, swinging again. Panic surged through me like a lightning bolt, and instinct took over. I hit the ground, heart pounding, as the bat swung past the air above me. That's when I heard a evil laughter. In dismay, of course, because he wasn't able to hit my head. Yes, she said that. I shouted and asked her what she was doing and hopefully to wake the people up in the room as I tried to find the light switch. She then told me that her son John no longer loves her because he chose me over her and that I need to be out of this world to get his son back. She also said that I should be the one who should leave the house because that was built by her husband. I was appalled. I mean, is she really trying to kill me right now? <laughs> and just before she swung the bat again, I was able to find the light switch and turn on the lights. Drunk John was obviously looking for me in the dark and ran to me when the light switch came on. He asked me if I was okay, and that's the only time I noticed that I could not feel my right shoulder. Okay, so here I am now, at the hospital and just got my shoulder braced. John and I and some other relatives have a small talk regarding what to do with Susan. Before we even gave suggestions, John told us that he would kick Susan out tomorrow and would not be allowed to come near us again. He just doesn't want to leave her right now out because she's drunk. Then I told him that I was really appreciative for him doing that because I don't want her anywhere near me or our child. Yes, that's right. I'm pregnant. I was actually planning to announce it on Christmas, but I guess this happened. Anyways, everybody in the room was shocked and happy at the same time. They congratulated me and even some joke that I was lucky because Susan did not hit my tummy. Who knows what would have happened? Yeah, fortunately, she did not. As I lie here in the hospital bed, I can't help but think about the upcoming family events. Will we need security checks for bats at the front door? Well, whatever happens, one thing is for sure. Susan is officially out of the picture. And I've gotten my husband back. Final update. 
Thank you to those who congratulated us. I am now two months pregnant and the bat fiasco was a month ago. While I thought that I would be free from the terror of my mother-in-law Susan, oh boy, I was wrong. Things took a creepy turn when we noticed Susan lurking in the shadows like a stalker. At first we brushed it off thinking that she would not do something serious again, but we were wrong. Our trusty CCTV footage camera caught Susan red-handed, or should I say red-keyed, my poor car. Yep, she decides to unleash her anger on my vehicle. I'm talking tires punctured like some weird twisted art project. And now, I'm not a car expert, but I'm pretty sure tire puncturing isn't part of a regular vehicle maintenance. <laughs> Had enough of that, Susan, show? Well, we did too. So, what do you do when your mother-in-law turns into a vehicular vandal? We filed restraining orders. How I wish we would have done this ages ago. Anyways, John uh, was sending Susan a monthly allowance, and this is why I love my husband. Anyways, John threatened his mother to not be anywhere near us or our child. No babysitting, no cuddles, not even a peek from a distance. Break the rules and the allowance will be stopped. I guess some of you will think what we did was too far, but we did what we had to do to protect our family. Anyways, that's all. I want to thank you for coming with me on this journey, and I hope I don't have any more updates because that means my life is finally peaceful. See you later. Ciao. So I think Susan has to be up there with some of the worst mother-in-laws that we've read about in the past few weeks. I mean, being attacked by a baseball bat in the dark, having to deal with a broken shoulder, and then having your car vandalized by the same woman. I don't blame them for wanting to cut off all contact towards the end of the story. And I do want to know what you guys would have done if you were in this position. I can understand it might be hard for the son because that's his mom, but at the end of the day, he had to do what was best for his family, and now we find out that OP is pregnant. Guys, thank you for joining me on today's video. My name's Mr. Redito. I narrate stories like this every single day, so if you want to be a part of these daily animated drama readings, go ahead, hit that subscribe button, guys. Thank you once again for joining me. I hope to see you tomorrow. And of course, remember, it's cool to be kind. See ya.